Because of the strain built into the three-membered epoxide ring, these cyclic ethers are susceptible to nucleophilic substitution reactions, and strong nucleophiles will open epoxides through a pretty much pure SN2 mechanism with concerted formation of the nucleophile carbon bond and cleavage of the carbon-oxygen bond. Under acidic conditions, with much weaker nucleophiles in the presence of an acid, nucleophilic substitution of epoxides can also occur. So ring opening can be done under acidic conditions as well. But in this case, protonation of the epoxide oxygen comes before nucleophilic substitution. And so we're dealing with an electrophile that is not a neutral epoxide, but a protonated epoxide. And that protonated epoxide is highly electrophilic. So neutral elect uh, nucleophiles, neutral nucleophiles like alcohols and water can then open the epoxide. And so as a general mechanism here, the first thing we're going to do is protonate the epoxide. Now you might imagine, particularly when the epoxide is highly substituted, imagine I had two other groups here, you might imagine that this could actually open to form an open carbocation with the hydroxyl group linked to the carbon next to the cationic center. Um, however, this generally does not occur in ring opening reactions of epoxides, even when we have a highly substituted carbon like this. And we'll discuss the evidence for this actually when we get down to the stereochemistry, but for the time being, very briefly, just take my word for it that no open carbocation forms in this reaction mechanism. This can be proven using the stereochemical outcome. And so in general, what we observe here as well is an SN2 type mechanism involving the protonated epoxide being attacked by the nucleophile with cleavage of the carbon-oxygen bond occurring at the same time. So for example, if we use a hydrohalic acid, HX, the X minus anion, the halide anion, attacks at the electrophilic carbon and the CO bond breaks all at the same time, and we get this halohydrin. Interesting way to make halohydrins. We could also use alcohols, and then we get these beta or 2-alkoxy alcohol products, and other nucleophiles work in this context as well, as long as they're weak, right? We're looking at water, neutral alcohols, neutral carboxylic acids, that kind of thing. Now, the stereochemistry here is very interesting because, again, we could imagine an open carbocation intermediate, a kind of SN1 type of reactivity for protonated epoxides under acidic conditions. This jives with what we've seen for alkyl halides, where when we use weak nucleophiles, it's quite common for an SN1 mechanism to be involved. However, the stereochemical outcome of the reaction argues against this. For example, if we take this epoxide and we hit it with HX, HBr, HCl. What we observe is selective substitution at the more substituted carbon, and we'll talk about why that is on the next slide. But at the same time, while this suggests maybe there's a tertiary carbocation involved, we observe exclusive inversion of configuration at the electrophilic carbon. So this carbon highlighted in purple is the one that reacts. So we go from an S configuration to an R configuration, and the key thing to notice is that the carbon-oxygen bond is sort of up and to the left, and the new carbon X bond is down and to the right. So an inversion of configuration has occurred, a kind of umbrella flip, right, of these three groups has taken place in going from the reactant to the product. So there's an inversion of configuration that takes place here. This argues against an open carbocation, since an open carbocation would lead to a mixture of inversion and retention of configuration. And this inversion is observed regardless of the configuration of the starting material, right? So if we start with the S epoxide, we get, get the R product. If we switch up the configuration in the reactant, start with the R epoxide, we get the S product. So this is a stereospecific inversion of configuration. Great evidence for an SN2 mechanism. The regiochemistry of ring opening of epoxides under acidic conditions is probably the most complicated regiochemical situation that you'll encounter maybe in both organic chemistry one and organic chemistry two, uh, because it gets quite subtle since there's a competition between two different things going on here. We saw in the last slide with the stereochemistry that the mechanism of this reaction is likely SN2. Even when the epoxide is protonated, there's no ring opening to a carbocation. This suggests the uh, reaction should be sensitive to steric effects and that steric hindrance should play a role in determining the regiochemical outcome. This is observed 
in some circumstances. However, in other circumstances, we observe regiochemistry that suggests that it's actually the partial positive charge in the epoxide and where that's living, where most of the partial positive charge that's, is living, that drives the regioselectivity. And these are two different carbons in the epoxide. And what happens actually depends on the substitution patterns of both of the carbons of the epoxide ring. So we're going to look at two cases where the outcomes are different. In the first case, we've got a primary carbon versus a secondary carbon. So here, for example, we have a primary carbon, just a CH2, and a secondary carbon, a CH with another alkyl substituent. In this case, reaction occurs selectively at the less hindered primary position. And the main reason for this is the, typical, the classic SN2 factor of steric hindrance. The secondary carbon is more sterically hindered than the primary carbon, and so nucleophilic attack occurs here. We get an X linked to the less substituted position. The second case we're going to look at is a tertiary epoxide carbon versus a primary or secondary. So this is any epoxide that has a tertiary carbon in it, essentially. So here, for example, we have a primary carbon versus a tertiary carbon, under these circumstances, reaction occurs selectively at the tertiary carbon. So there's a switch in the regioselectivity now where apparently sterics is not the main driving factor, right? If sterics were the main driving factor, reaction would occur at the primary carbon, not the tertiary one. Even when that carbon is secondary, we still get selective reaction at the tertiary carbon, even though the secondary carbon, again, is going to be less hindered than the tertiary carbon. So it's not sterics that's driving this effect. In fact, it's an electronic effect having to do with where positive charge really lives in the protonated epoxide intermediate. So here, for example, in the first case, and this result generalizes to really any epoxide containing a, a fully substituted carbon like this, we can actually draw resonance forms of this epoxide where we break the carbon-oxygen bonds toward oxygen, showing that the carbons are sharing some of the positive charge in the protonated epoxide. This isn't exactly a street legal version of resonance, right, since we're breaking a sigma bond, but it's illustrative, and to me it's legal as long as we keep in mind we're not actually moving the atoms. We can do that to generate this tertiary carbocation, or we can break the other CO bond to generate a hypothetical primary carbocation. But this doesn't look right, right? This is a primary carbocation, and those are a no-no. So this is a minimal contributor to the true structure of the protonated epoxide. And what it shows us is that most of the partial positive charge is actually living on this more substituted carbon in the protonated epoxide intermediate. And so nucleophiles are drawn to this partial positive charge. Right, there's an electrostatic attraction between the X minus anion, right, the halide anion, and this partial positive charge. This explains why X minus ends up linking to that more substituted carbon in the protonated epoxide. So it's all about the electronics of the protonated epoxide intermediate. It's really only this tertiary carbon that can support enough positive charge to make this an important effect. When all we have, quote unquote, is a secondary carbon in the epoxide, well then we default back to the it's an SN2 reaction uh, idea and we're going to attack at the less substituted position in that case. So this is complicated. It's a pretty complicated regiochemical situation where a tertiary carbon leads to a different outcome than a, a secondary carbon and attack at tertiary carbons kind of wins the day due to this electronic effect. So you want to be really careful when predicting the products of ring opening of epoxides under acidic conditions when the epoxide has two carbons uh, with different substitution patterns. This is a skill that I think really requires a lot of practice, and so on this slide we're going to predict the products of these acidic ring, opening of ring openings of epoxides thinking mechanistically throughout this process. And so we know we're in acidic conditions, for example, in the first reaction because we're dealing with sulfuric acid, H2SO4. So the first step is going to be protonation of the epoxide oxygen. The other thing we want to notice here is that we have a tertiary carbon and a secondary carbon 
in the epoxide. So a difference in substitution pattern, meaning we're going to have a regiochemical issue. So here's the protonated epoxide, and based on our kind of regiochemical ideas, we know that this is where the positive charge is really located, that tertiary carbon, and this is where nucleophilic attack is, is going to occur. The phenyl ring actually plays a role in this as well, since it can stabilize positive charge even more than just a plain vanilla alkyl group, right? So the nucleophile is going to attack here. What is the nucleophile? Well, ethanol is around in solvent quantities, and the ethanol oxygen is a decent nucleophile. So we're going to attack there and open the ring in an SN2 step. This is important for the stereochemical outcome, right? We want to make sure to depict inversion of configuration at this electrophilic center in this step, and it's worth pausing the video now and verifying that, in fact, this does show an inversion of configuration. Again, there's some kind of mental gymnastics where you want to do here, where you imagine the ethanol coming from behind this ethyl group, pushing the ethyl group forward such that the ethanol group ends up in the back, and then we're going to deprotonate that ethoxy group to generate the neutral product which has the ethoxy group linked to the more substituted carbon and the OH group derived from the oxygen of the epoxide still linked to the less substituted carbon. And notice that this stereocenter, the secondary carbon that was just along for the ride the whole time, its configuration stays the same throughout the mechanism. In the second case, we again have a difference in substitution pattern with a tertiary or fully substituted carbon and a secondary carbon. And we've got HBr now as the acid. It's a strong acid. We're going to protonate the epoxide first. This generates the protonated epoxide and Br minus. With a tertiary carbon, that's where we're going to do the attack. It's an SN2 ring opening, and so we're going to imagine an inversion of configuration. Although, interestingly enough, this electrophilic carbon is not a stereocenter, so it actually does not matter if that inversion of configuration occurs in this particular case. And the opening occurs to give this halohydrin, in fact. And again, notice this carbon wasn't directly involved. The secondary carbon was not directly involved in the ring opening, and so its configuration remains the same throughout the reaction. 